Brother Douglas is a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He's been preaching the gospel regularly since 1977. He served Churches of Christ in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia. He's done full-time mission work in the Ukraine and the United Kingdom. He worked in public education for about 10 years where he served as a teacher, a principal, college instructor, and now is involved in business as he preaches. He's preached over the radio for about 20 years and is a teacher with Truth Bible Institute. And he currently is preaching for the Central Church of Christ in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, and working as an insurance broker. Somebody said the other day he has a lot of spare time. He's also involved in the work in the Philippines trying to plan now, in fact, to make a trip back there. He's blessed with a faithful, uh, with faithful support and a very dedicated wife, Laarne, in doing the Lord's work. And they are blessed with two precious children, Lydia and Daniel Moses. We've had the privilege of having Daniel Moses with us this week, too, who did a fine job for his dad in reading the scriptures the other day. Brother Douglas, come speak to us on this very timely and important topic. Thank you, Brother Brown. Indeed, it is an honor and a privilege to be with the Lord's Church here at Spring with all these great and godly people, young and old, brothers and sisters in Christ, faithful preachers of the gospel, and faithful elders, and many others. And again, I would like to thank Brother and Sister Brown for hosting us this week. As always, dear friends and gracious hospitality, and we're so thankful to them and for them. And for the elders here, and for Brother Brown and directing the lectureship, and I know Sister Sonia's done a lot of work on this, too. I want to commend her. And also, all the members of this congregation are so very faithful. I know it's not just the preachers and elders and speakers that do the work. There's many others that are doing the work. And you're to be commended, and we thank the Lord for you, each and every one. And the Lord knows who you are. And just thanks be unto God for this great privilege to be here, as always, and certainly a, a great honor to appear with these other great and godly men who preach the gospel so ably and faithfully and are willing to suffer for the cause of the Lord. I appreciate Brother Jeff a while ago mentioning, uh, well, his whole prayer and his prayer for Brother Ken Chumley, a dear and beloved brother in Christ, and having serious surgery tomorrow, we pray for him and Sister Linda and their grandson that they are bringing up. We're so thankful for all three of them, and we want to keep them in our prayers so near and dear to our hearts. Friends, uh, I heard the story told many years ago about a man who was a member of the church and he had a drinking problem. And he would drink, and supposedly he would repent, and turn around, do better. Then he would fall off the wagon again, as the saying goes. And he'd go to drinking again. Well, this, just, this cycle kept on and on. He just kept, but he never really did repent, truly. He never overcame it. So finally the church decided to withdraw from him. So one Sunday they got up and announced that they were going to withdraw from this brother for his drunkenness, which of course is a sin. And after they did that, he got up and he said, well, I hate to see all y'all go, but I'll carry on the best I can. <laughs> you know, friends, this is the extent probably that some people have as to the knowledge of what it means. And I would like to begin this morning by reading our lesson text that relates to this theme, withdrawing fellowship from disorderly members of the church, including family members. 
This is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 6. And I would like to begin by giving an overview of this verse and then going into more detail. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 6, the Apostle Paul declares, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. In the first place, this is a command of God. Now that's significant. If someone were to get into the pulpit today and say, Now you can be saved, but you have to believe on the Lord, and you have to repent, and you have to confess His name, but I really don't think you have to be baptized. You would say, now that fellow is a false teacher, and rightly so. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Or if someone got up here and were to say, yes, we're going to continue to take the Lord's Supper, but we're just not going to do it on every Lord's Day, every first day of the week. Although in the book of Acts, we read of the early church that upon the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. That is representative of the Lord's Supper. Certainly we would say that that man is teaching false doctrine, and indeed he would be. But for some strange reason, there are many congregations who would not tolerate that kind of teaching, but these congregations themselves do not practice this command of God right here. Now is it or is it not a command of God? Just as much as baptism and the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day is the command to withdraw from the disorderly. It's a command, and moreover Paul said in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is a name that carries all authority with it. Anything and everything authorized by his doctrine, the New Testament, is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, verse 18. So Paul here speaks with the authority of Christ as an apostle and inspired man of God. Paul said that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. Every brother. That is, any member of the church who is walking in disobedience to the will of God and will not repent, it doesn't matter who it is, husband, wife, son or daughter, mother, father, brother, or sister, best friend, the inspired word of God says, every brother that walketh disorderly. Now, to walk disorderly, means to walk out of rank or out of step. It is an old military term. And Vine says it carries with it the idea of insubordination. We know that if a soldier is insubordinate, he is disobedient to the authorities that he is under. And he puts lives in danger and the cause for which he is supposedly a part of, in danger, when he becomes insubordinate. When a member of the church of our Lord, for which he died, becomes disorderly, and out of rank, and out of step, and insubordinate, and heart disobedient, that individual not only has put his own soul in danger, but he threatens the spiritual welfare of the congregation, and all the souls that are therein. When he becomes insubordinate to the captain of his salvation, Jesus Christ. And he is the captain of our salvation, according to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 10. And then Paul further elaborates on the idea of walking disorderly, that it is to walk not according to, to the tradition which he received of us. 
That is not speaking of human tradition, which humans have originated, but that which has been received by inspiration of God and has been delivered by the apostles who received the promise that Jesus gave in John 16, verse 13, before he died, rose again, and went back to heaven. The promise that was fulfilled after he ascended back to heaven in Acts 2, beginning on the day of Pentecost, that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And hence, the tradition that the disorderly brother or sister is not holding fast to and not keeping with is the truth that has been given through the apostles by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is an overview of the verse here. But now we want to look further into the matter. The command is in the name of Jesus Christ. As was pointed out by Brother Stolting in his fine lesson a while ago, that when we do not obey that command, we are disobedient to God. When a congregation does not obey that command to withdraw from the disorderly. And indeed, that is the case. It is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and all that we do is to be done in His name, that is, according to His Word and by His authority. In Colossians 3, 17, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him, that is, according to the authority of Jesus Christ. We know that all salvation is in the name of Jesus Christ. In Acts 2, verse 38, when the Jews on Pentecost asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When we go to the next chapter, in Acts chapter 3, as Peter and John went up to the temple, at the ninth hour being the hour of prayer, they saw a man there at the gate called Beautiful who was lame. And Peter said to him, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In the New Testament, we see that these miracles were done in the name of Jesus Christ by his authority. The same name and authority by which people are saved. But in order to be saved... In the name of the Lord, we must obey the Lord's commands. Now in Acts chapter 4, later after this, when Peter and John stood before the Jewish Sanhedrin, Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said in verse number 10, Be it known unto you and to you all, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold, and then in verse number 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It is only in the name of Jesus Christ. Now I would like to turn to another passage with you in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where we see a command given in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This has to do with a brother who became caught up in fornication and specifically incest. He was having a relationship, uh, evidently with his father's wife, and the church had not dealt with this matter. But there is one aspect that sometimes is left out when we talked about dealing with the incestuous brother. And that is that Paul is also rebuking the church at Corinth. And not only did this brother in fornication need to repent, but the church at Corinth needed to repent too. And today there are many congregations in the brotherhood who need to repent for not dealing with the disorderly. Now as we begin here in verse number 3, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes, For I verily is absent in body, 
but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this is not Paul's opinion. This is not any man's opinion. This is a command of the Lord himself. He said this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now let's make a few observations right here. In the first place, it was not only given in the Lord's name, but the purpose of this action is also given that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This act was to save the fallen brother's soul. Now we've had some great lessons during the lectureship on love and how that love is to be sacrificial and even at our own expense when we have true love. Have you ever thought about the fact that withdrawing fellowship, it takes a sacrifice on our part, especially if it's a family member, but it's a great act of love. Paul said that love seeketh not her own. When we truly love that person's soul, as we've studied this week, that love is seeking the ultimate and the highest good of a person. And that is the salvation of their soul, not merely their feelings, but their soul salvation. We are going to do that which will save their souls. This is God's remedy to save the soul of a person who has fallen into sin and will not repent that that person might repent because of this withdrawal, this punitive action, that they might repent and come back to God and that their soul might be saved in the day of the Lord. That is, the judgment day. That's the idea there. And it is a good work. Oftentimes when we talk about a good work, we'll talk about feeding those who are in need or helping the sick, going out and teaching the lost, and those indeed are great works. But my friends, doing what the Bible commands regarding the disorderly is also a good work, and it also brings glory to God. In Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We know that this brother did repent after the church finally did do what the Lord required for them to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, this, of course, is after the withdrawal had taken place at Corinth. We see the result of this after Paul when he wrote this some time later, after that action had occurred, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 6 and 7, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. It is implied here that he did repent. The Lord taught that when a brother repents, we should forgive him in Luke 17, verse 3 and 4. And here Paul commands the church at Corinth to forgive this brother. So obviously he did repent, or they would not have been commanded to forgive him. Moreover, we note that the brethren at Corinth repented for their inaction when they failed to do what was right. James said, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James 4, 17. When we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we know that the church at Corinth responded to Paul's rebuke. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 2, and that they repented also. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse number 9, 
Now rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. And then he went on to say, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation not to be repented of, that is, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. As we consider this action in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, going back to the first epistle, before they actually did do the discipline that Paul commanded in the name of the Lord, we see that there is another purpose for this action. Not just to save the soul of the fallen brother, but in verses 6 through 8, we see the purpose in saving the church. Do we understand that when we have someone in our midst who is in willful sin in the midst of the congregation, that the church must deal with this person or the spiritual welfare of the congregation is going to be at stake? And this is what Paul teaches here in verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? And here, of course, the whole lump is referring to the church, the congregation. And the little leaven there is the leaven of evil, which represents the sin of that brother that he refused to repent of. And Paul also used that expression in Galatians 5.9 that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He said, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us not keep the feast, rather let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then the last statement in the chapter, at the end of verse 13, the first Corinthians 5, is this. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now that's very strong. But that is the way a person is described who walks in rebellion to Almighty God and who seeks to hurt the body of Jesus Christ, his precious bride, which he loved and gave himself for, Ephesians 5, verse 25. The church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. That's a serious matter. That is a wicked person. That's what the Bible says. That's what God said. That's not our opinion. That's what the Word of God teaches. A person who is walking willfully out of harmony with the will of the Lord is walking in wickedness and sin. And there needs to be this punitive measure taken. And Paul describes it as punishment. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, going back there, verse number 6, we read this a while ago, but I want to read it again. Regarding the act of withdrawing, that the church did toward the incestuous brother in fornication. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. This is what God intends. When a person's very soul is at stake, when the church is at stake, to inflict punishment on that person, that they might repent. It's love. It's not because we hate that person. It's because we love them. And Paul refers to it as punishment inflicted by many. And that refers to the members of the church. That leads to another thought. Faithful leaders may get up and read a statement of withdrawal or the intent to withdraw from a disorderly member of the church. But if the congregation does not honor that scriptural action, if it indeed is a scriptural withdrawal, then they are not carrying out God's will in the first place. And secondly, they are making it ineffective by not inflicting this punishment 
upon the person who has grown to think so little of Jesus Christ, who shed every drop of his precious blood for them to the point that when the spear was thrust in his side, the water followed the blood out of the body. That punishment is to be inflicted. That's what the Word of God teaches. Now, Paul had said here that Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. When a person becomes disorderly, they no longer appreciate that sacrifice and what the Lord did. So do we not see why the action has to be so strong and severe? Because that person is in the very clutches of Satan himself. James described it this way. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. A person in sin, whether it be an unfaithful member of the church or an alien sinner, we might say this. He's a walking dead man. You remember the woman that liveth in pleasure? 1 Timothy 5, 6. She is dead while she liveth. She's a walking dead woman. She is in sin. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, verse 23. When we think about this in the medical realm, how that... Sometimes extreme, extreme measures have to be taken to save a person's life. If one's arm gets an infection in it to the point that that infection cannot be turned back and overcome, say, for example, in the case of gangrene, if the doctors, no doubt they will labor to save that arm if they are good doctors. And they will do everything they can to save it. But if it reaches the point that either the arm is saved or the life is saved, they will sacrifice the arm and save the life. The gangrenous limb has to be removed. And such is the case when we have a brother or sister in the church who chooses to embark upon the path of sin again. To leave the light of Jesus Christ and to go back into darkness in order to save the church. That person must be put away from you, the Apostle Paul declared. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse, beginning at verse 9 here. <clears throat> Paul said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Now Paul is not encouraging us here to go out and run around and make our bosom buddies of fornicators and adulterers and idolaters and drunkards and so forth. He's not doing that. We know because evil companionships corrupt good morals, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. But he's saying that by virtue of the fact that you live in the world, that there are going to be times when you have to have social interaction with people that are worldly in nature. There may be times, for example, in your work that you have to eat with them or other things that have to do with social interaction just because you are living in this world. But when it comes to a member of the church who has become disorderly, look at verse 11. But there's an interjection there. Now here's the difference. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Eating there is a synecdoche where a part stands for the whole. Eating represents social intercourse with that person. 
It is representative of anything that we might do of a social nature with a person who's in the church who is disorderly. In that case, Paul forbids this. It's not to be done. With such an one, no, not to eat. As we think about this matter, eating together is an indication of agreement and fellowship, and we are not to do anything that would imply approval, agreement, or endorsement. I'd like to turn back for a moment to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 again, in verses 14 and 15. Paul said, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. You're not to have company with him. The fact of the matter is, if you have someone in the church who does not obey anything, or refuses to obey anything that is taught in this epistle or anywhere else in the New Testament. And that, my friends, includes the refusal to practice withdrawal. That person is to be noted, and we are to have no company with such a person. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. I would like to recount an incident that happened to me as a preacher just a few years ago in a congregation in Middle Tennessee where I preached for one year. I'd been there just a few months, and it was right after the Christmas holidays, I believe it was. I learned that there was a young woman in the congregation, and she was living with a man. And this had been going on for six months. I know that at least one family knew about it. They knew about that. You know that family did wrong. And they knew about that. And they did not bring it to the attention of the rest of the congregation. And this lady, furthermore, this young lady was even doing the church bulletin. Can you believe that? She was doing the church bulletin and living with someone in fornication, not married. And her sister and her family were there, and her in-laws, her sister's in-laws were there. And I think they knew about it. Certainly her sister knew about it. Well, when this came to my attention, I immediately began to preach on what needed to be done and to arrange a, a meeting with this woman, but not because it was a personal offense. But the idea was to get a few brethren together and try to persuade her to repent. And by the way, Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17 does not apply to public sin as far as having to take the steps that are taken here in Matthew 18 of going one and then taking one or two witnesses in that process. That is regarding a personal offense. And moreover, Matthew 18 does not apply to dealing with public false teachers either, which many people try to do that. But anyway, we finally met with this young woman, and she agreed. She admitted that you all, you're right. You're right in what you're saying. But I'm not going to give him up. She refused to repent. So we decided to have a men's meeting to proceed with the withdrawal. And we did. But I remember that men's meeting. Uh, there was one man there. He said, well, I'll eat with her if I want to. That was his attitude. I will eat with her if I want to. Now, I will stay with that just a moment. Yes, we can eat with a withdrawn from person if we want to. That's true. We can also our fellowship with darkness if we want to, which we're forbidden to do, Ephesians 5.11. My friends, we can also drink alcohol 
We can gamble. We can forsake the assembly, which many do. We can take the name of the Lord our God in vain. We can go out and commit fornication and adultery and all these other works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, to 21 if we want to. But you know something? You can't do that and go to heaven. You can't want to disobey God and go to heaven. You cannot live in rebellion to the will of God and go anywhere but the eternal lake of fire. Yes, you can do wrong if you want to. But you can't do wrong and please the Lord and be saved. Yes, we can disregard God's will on this matter if, we will, if that's our choice. We can do that. But we cannot please the Lord our God and do so. In Matthew 10, verse 28, Jesus Christ said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And the preacher said in Ecclesiastes 12, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. But now, my friends, I want to move on toward the end of our lesson. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, that we are to withdraw from every brother that walketh disorderly. Every brother, anyone who chooses to embark on the path of sin and to rebel against the Lord. This would necessarily include family members because the Bible says every brother. God is no respecter of persons. You remember in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, when they died in Abihu, rebelled against God by offering strange fire to the Lord that he did not authorize, God consumed them and destroyed them with fire. It did not matter that those two men were the nephews of Moses, the leader of Israel, and they also were the sons of Aaron, the first high priest in Israel. God is no respecter of persons. And we are not to be either. But if we choose to disregard this command because it involves our family, then we are being a respecter of persons. Or because it is a friend of ours. Now, in Matthew 28, 20, and in John 15, 14, Jesus uses a word, whatsoever. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. John 15, 14, ye are my friends if, that is, if and only if you do whatsoever I command you. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You will keep my commandments. John 14 and verse 15. The question is, do we love Jesus Christ more than our family? You know that if you love the Lord more than you do your wife, that you will love your wife more dearly and deeply than a man who loves his wife more than he loves Christ? You know, that's true. That if you love your son or daughter less than you love the Lord, then you will love your son and daughter more, much more, because you will have a greater capacity for love and heart of love than a person who loves anybody or anything more than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Matthew 10, verse 37 and 38, and I believe this verse, this passage, applies directly to what we're talking about. 
Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And we've heard some great lessons this week also about loving God and loving our neighbor. We know Jesus said the great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Mark 12 and verse 30. That means all of our being. That means that there cannot be anybody or anything that equals the love that we have for the Lord our God. But now, what about family relations in which we have God-given obligations? Such as, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul said, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves a fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency or your lack of self-control. In other words, don't withhold yourself from your husband. Or from your wife. And what if, for example, John Doe, a member of the church, becomes a drunkard? And he won't repent. The church finally has to withdraw from him. Does that mean that Sally, his wife, has to disobey 1 Corinthians chapter 7? I do not believe that it does, my friends. And although she continues to be to him as a wife... She has to make it very plain to him, I'm not in fellowship with you. You are in a lost condition. You're lost without God. Another example might be in Ephesians 6 too, honor thy father and mother. Let's say that your parents are withdrawn from by the church. The scripture withdraw, and in 20 or 30 years they become infirmed in need of your help. Can you not go and help them in their infirmity and still practice the withdrawal? My friends, I do not believe that this command to withdraw causes us to be unobligated to keep God's commands in the family relationship. We do not understand it to teach that. However, it also means that we must make it plain to them and clear that we're not in fellowship together because you're not in fellowship with God. And one question more. Someone says, well, can I never talk to my son or daughter again or my, my parents or whoever it is in our family? In 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, which we read a while ago, it says to have no company with him, that is, no social relationship. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. How could we continue to warn and admonish that person if we could not in some way communicate with them? The Bible does not disallow us to tell people that are lost that we love them and that we care about them and to com communicate this to them. But also we must admonish and warn them of their condition. Yes, we can communicate our love for them, but we must admonish them and warn them of their lost condition. My friends, this morning as we come to a close, it's been my observation in the Lord's church that there are many good and godly families that are touched personally by this situation. And it's a great challenge. And in every congregation, eventually there's going to be a situation where someone has to be dealt with because of sin. That's the nature of this world in which we live and the way that people are. 
Sin is all around us. And we live in a sinful world. And these things today are sad in love for us. That indeed, we ourselves will not become disorderly. And that we will not become disorderly by refusing to obey this command given in the name above all names. In the name of one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And another thing I hope and pray this morning is that this lesson has emphasized to our hearts what a serious matter it is to be in sin and out of Christ. And how urgent the matter of obedience to the gospel is. If one has never named the name of Christ and obeyed the gospel. Or if there be anyone here today who is walking out of fellowship with God, who has departed from the light and needs to come back. Would we not hear what Peter told Simon, who had been a sorcerer but converted, but who fell into sin shortly thereafter? Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. There in Acts 8, 22 to 24, and the wonderful thing is, that Simon complied with that command. And oh, my friend, you can do that too. You know that Peter said that if one knows the truth and leaves it, he is in a worse condition than if he never knew it. There in 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. If you realize this morning I have sin in my life, I am not right with God. It could be forsaking the assembly. It could be that you are guilty of the sin of neglect. The Hebrews writer teaches that we cannot be saved with this great salvation if we neglect it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2 and 3. But also today, for one who has never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I read this story years ago about this 15-year-old boy, one Lord's Day evening, he came and he obeyed the gospel. He put on Christ in baptism. He did what the Bible says, to hear and believe the gospel, Romans 10, 17, to repent, Acts 2, 38, confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37, and then do not tarry, do not delay, but arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And he did that very thing. And in so doing, he put on Jesus Christ in baptism. He went down in sin and he came up in Christ. Isn't that a great thing? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. Well, he did that that Sunday evening. Within 24 hours, the preacher received a phone call. This young man had lost his life. And I believe it was a tractor accident on the farm. And his mother asked the preacher to do the funeral. And she said to the preacher this, What if this had happened a week earlier? A week earlier. My friends, when it comes to our soul, we can't play around. We cannot afford to wait. Today is a day of salvation. If you need to come, please come while we stand.